Okay, so hello and welcome back. <coughs> so now let's talk about the miscellaneous exercises and exercises on chapter one. And uh, basically, the first question is uh, basically f of x is equal to is is a function from r to r such that defined by f of x is equal to 10x plus 7, right? And you want to find g from r to r such that g o f is equal to f o g is equal to i of r. Now this question, what this means is that is that basically you simply want to find the, the inverse of f. Uh, and the reason why it's been written this way is that uh, of course the question is not very clear but that i um i um i found that based on the solution i took a look at the solution and saw that basically this is um this is meant by the problem otherwise there is i mean there is some sort of ambiguity here um, there is no way to know what is meant by i mean this could mean possibly many different things um, but but that, that's that's let's not talk about that <coughs> so the reason why this notation can be used is that basically you have some function from let's say that you have some function from x to from x some set x to some set y right so the the, the set over here basically f is a mapping from x to y meaning that uh, all of the elements of x are mapped to some elements in to some elements in y and uh, so this is a function right and so you can call the elements of this 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 set you can call them x and the elements of this x you can call them y right now the this is a function that goes from x to y and so now if you want to find some way in order to 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 go from y to go from y into x meaning that meaning that you go in the in the opposite direction then you have to find the inverse of f the inverse of f could be some function like g that goes from that goes from y to x right if, if sometimes it's possible to to, to define that function as well based on f sometimes it's not but then if it's possible to define the the inverse of f then then g basically is a function that goes from y into x <coughs> now we have shown before that uh, that basically uh, g o f we have shown that g o f is the same thing as i of x and we have shown that f o g is equal to i of y. And I don't remember the, the exact process anymore, but um, but uh, I mean I, I mean the line of reasoning I don't I do not remember anymore. But then if you can show that g o f is equal to i of x and f o g is equal to i of y logically that means that basically g is the inverse of f right so and uh, one more thing that that we also talked about was that basically if a function is for example suppose that you have the function f over here the function f has to be one one and it has to be unto meaning that it has to be injective it has to be surjective as well and so if if the function is both injective and surjective the function is called a bijective function if the function is bijective then the inverse of that function exists otherwise it does not exist i mean there is no way to find the the, the, the inverse for a function that is not bijective meaning that for example suppose that you have some function some function f here that goes from some x to some y and then you have basically a b and c here and you have one two and three here right now suppose that the function go if the function is one one then basically you have for example and this is a mapping from 
from x to y let's call it f suppose that a is mapped to 1 b is mapped to 2 c is mapped to 3 right suppose that this is this sir. then of course it's possible to to basically do a couple of things and find some mapping from this set to this set that's basically that takes you from 1 to a from 2 to b and from 3 to c right and that function whatever you want to call it call it g for example would of course logically be, in, be the inverse of f now suppose that this that this function is not uh, 1 1 right now the function is 1 1 meaning that uh, meaning that it's not many one now suppose that you have you have some function which is many one for example you have some function x some two sets x and y here and you have a b and c and for example one two and three and let's say that let's suppose that this function is many one right and let's say that there is there is there is even another another element here d which is mapped to, to three right so all of these elements are images of some element in the domain of the function but then the problem is that a and b are both mapped to one then if i and then let's call this for example f <coughs> this is a one one function and this is a many one function now the problem with this function is that if i want to get back from here to here meaning that if i define some g to get me from 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 y to x then if I want, if I, if I start at one, and if I want to get back to some element in the, in the, in the codomain of this function g, which happens to be the domain of the function f, then basically I do not really know what to do, meaning that one is mapped to, to a is mapped to b, so then in, in this case basically g of one would be equal to a would be equal to b, and a is not equal to b so that that's just not 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 possible so that means that if a function is many one the function of the the, the inverse of the function does not exist <coughs> so the function has to be one one right now one more thing that, that that is also important is that the function has to be unto the function being unto is that right now this function is 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 actually on two this function is actually on two and the reason why it's on two is that basically all of the as you can see if i take this if i take this set as the codomain of the function then of the function f for example then every element that you can see in the codomain of the function is the image of some element in the domain of the function right so one is the image of a two is the image of b and three is the image of c <coughs> and since all of these elements are covered then we call this function an onto function on the other hand you can have a function which is not onto meaning that for example you could have for example one two and three here and you could have for example this called it set x and set y and you have a b and c here and let's say that one one is mapped to a two is mapped to b or and three is mapped to b for example this is a function of course there is no problem with it f basically is a function but <clears throat> and of course if i want to get back from these elements back to here meaning that if i if i basically uh, define some some function g to get me back from from y to x you can see that g of you can see that g of a is one g of b is um, well there is a problem here let's suppose that for example um, let's suppose that this is of course not the case so that of course the function is not one one so Let's suppose that, for example, there is some element d over here, and 3 is mapped to c. So g of b is equal to 2, and g of c is equal to, for example, 3. But then g of d is not defined. g 
GRB is not defined, right? And it's just not possible. And this this now becomes the becomes the the domain of this function g. And from the domain in the domain of this function, there is a there is an element that is not mapped to any element in the codomain of the function, which is of course by definition not possible, and therefore this is not a function in the first place. So this is an example of a, of a function. So f basically is example of a function which is not which is not unto. <clears throat> and so if a function is not unto, of course, as you can see, the, the inverse of the function does not exist. Meaning that long story short, a function has to be uh, the function has to be uh, basically uh, one one and unto so that it is so that it is invertible. The function has to be one one or in other words, you can also call it injective. The function has to be injective or one one. It also has to be surjective or surjective or or unto. And then if that's the case, then you can call the function bijective. You can call the function bijective. If that is the case, then that implies that basically the function that the inverse of the that the inverse of the of the function exists of the function exists. So so then that's that's basically why whenever we want to find the inverse of, of any function, first we check whether the function is one one and and also we check that the function is on two. If both of them are the case, then we find the inverse of the function. And through some logic, we found that basically, um, we found that if, basically we found that if you have some function f from, for example, some set x to some set y, and if you have some function g from the sets from the same set y to the same set x now if basically if g is the is the inverse of is the inverse of x uh, is the inverse of so is, is is the inverse of f then then basically uh, then you can say that then you can say that um, um, then you can say that um, f o g or g o f is equal to i of x, and uh, f o g is equal to i of y. And also we showed that, uh, and also we showed that we showed that basically, we also showed that if Basically, g o f is equal to i of x, and f o g is equal to is equal to i of y. Then, basically, g is the inverse of is the inverse of is the inverse of f. So you can see that this is the converse of this logically, and since it's the converse of that. And this is, this is, this is basically an, a if then, if then statement. This is also an if then statement, but this is the converse of this. Then you can say that basically G is the inverse of F. You can say that G is the inverse of F. The inverse of F. If and only if. Or instead of this, you can actually write I double F if. <coughs> so then you can say that G is the inverse of F if, if and only if basically G O F is equal to I of X and F O G is equal to I of Y. Right? 
And in case you're wondering what this means, so basically G O F is equal to I of X. This is the identity fun the this is the identity function on the set X. So the set X is basically nothing but the domain of the domain of F, right? So this was this was basically the domain of F as you can see over here is is X. And so when I write when we when I write I of X, I, I mean the identity function on on the on the set x and if i assume that basically um, the, the the members of x can be represented by lowercase x then then that means that i of x of x is equal to x for all x for all x belonging to belonging to x and when i write i of y that mean that what i mean by that is the identity function on the on this set y right which is the codomain of f and if i assume that basically that the members of this y are lowercase y i can say i of y of y is equal to y for all y belonging to y right so what this means is that the identity function is nothing but the function that um is not is just a function that 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 basically that that's that's the identity function on a particular set which means that if if a function is a, is is the identity function on some particular set from that set basically whatever element you pick and input into the function the function is going to give you back the same the same element for example you can say that you can say that, for example, the function f of x is equal to x is the identity function on the set of integers. It's the identity function on the set of real numbers. It's the identity function on the set of um, natural numbers. It's the identity function on the set of these cues, basically. What, what is that? I don't remember the name. But it means that, for example, if any, if I give this function a two, it will give me back a two. Now you can imagine that two is a member of an of, of the set of natural numbers, is of the set of integers, of the set of whole numbers, of the set of real numbers. Whatever you want to imagine, you can imagine. Of course, it's possible. So that's the identity function. So that that basically means that this function, whatever you give it, it will give you the same thing back right and uh, and again if you're wondering what this what this whole thing means so and and it makes sense that that when i say g o f of g o f is equal to i of x as you can see here g o f of basically of x is the same thing as g of f of x right now f of x is equal to y right so i can write g of y and g of y is equal to x as you can see i any x that i that i input into this function i will i will get the same thing back and therefore i can write g o f is equal to i of x and here i'm i'm writing a capital x meaning that what i'm referring to is this set over here and not this this lowercase x which means that some element from that from the set x and when i say that fog is equal to i of y when i say fog of is equal to y of y that that that's a, that's also very simple fog of y is equal to uh, f of g of y of course right and so what that means that you know that g of y is equal to x g of y over here is equal to x and so that is f of x and you know that f of x is equal to y right so that means that you input the y over here you get the same thing back so i can write f of f o g is equal to i of y because it's the because it's just some notation that means that this function is the identity on the set y from the set y whatever y you in input into this function you're going to get the same basically the same y back so that's basically the whole story 
Now I don't remember how we came into this. We came to this conclusion. It's I would have to go back and read the definitions and the line of reasoning and on all of those things, which is uh, not really necessary right now. I mean, as 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 as. Um, As, 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 as far as you, I mean, as long as you understand that, that basically, that, uh, the function, I mean, whatever sort of function that you have, if you want to find the inverse of that function, first of all, the function has to be bijective. And then, if the function is bijective, that means that the inverse of the function exists, right? So that is something to understand. And moreover, if you, if you find some function, for example, suppose that you have some function f that goes from x to y. If you find through any sort of method, it doesn't matter how you find that function. Suppose that somebody, um, for example, in a physics class, I saw on a, on a, uh, on, on, I, I saw on the, on YouTube, there was a class, some university lecture on, physics it was some I, I think some 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 Harvard University or some university some good university basically and you know that basically physicists usually they don't care about mathematics that much they use mathematics but they but their mathematics is most of the time is well wrong based on the mathematics that we do here they mix everything up and they mix up the domains and ranges of the functions and so on and so forth. They, they do all kinds of crazy things in mathematics. But what they do is, of course, it's not wrong. It's, it works basically, but sometimes they do crazy things in, in, in mathematics. Now he was, uh, he was talking about some 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 scenario some scenario in 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 physics that this is this is this is all of these forces and then this is the this is the net force and so on and so forth and so basically you if you put all of these together you'll get this function and then if you if you in, if you integrate this function you will get this function of course if you were to do the integration I mean, based on the examples, I would, based on the example and based on the situation, I would assume that, that it would, it would take you, for example, a long time in order to, 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 to go through the integration process and so on and so forth. But then he had, he was, of course, an experienced teacher and he knew that the, the, the integral of that function, he wrote it down. And he said that, don't ask me how I know this. I, how I know th what the, the integral of this function. I just know it. Somebody told me. You know, somebody just, somebody has told me that the integral of this function is this. And I have tested it and it works. If you want to do, if you want to integrate this function, do it on your own time. Be my guest. Integrate the fun, the, the function and you will come up with the same thing. So it's basically, the same story here. Now it doesn't really matter how you come up with the with the inverse of the function. Usually, of course, you use algebra, right? But using whatever method you come up with the with the inverse of this function, you will get some other function, right? You will get some other function in 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 y basically. In the, 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 of course the the variable is going to change. You have to change it so that your notation basically fits together. But then you will find the function. And then if you want to know that, if you want to make sure that logically the function that you have found, meaning that G is actually the inverse of F, you have to check for this condition that if basically the that, that, that if basically g o f is equal to i of x and f o g is equal to i of y, then basically the g is the inverse of f. And of course it makes sense 
because if g o f is i of x that means that it's the identity function it's the identity function and the domain of f right meaning that meaning that if if basically g o f is the is the identity function on 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 basically on the domain of f what that means is that uh, is that from 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 this set whatever you give to that to gof gof is going to give you the same thing back right so you can imagine that so that for example this is the set x and this is the set y and this is f for example right so and uh, g is some function that goes from y to x so you have your function i'm sorry you you have to set x over here at, again and g is basically some function like this that basically whose input becomes the output of f and then the, it, the output of, of g becomes again the input of f right because these are these are the same sets this is x and this is x now g o f is basically um, g o f is basically is is nothing but this g o f is nothing but g of f of x right so if you have an x over here then you will have some f of x over here right and then this f of x g basically operates on this f of x so this this becomes g of f of x this becomes g of f of x so which means that g g of f of x is some function that is some function that that basically uh, is is that it instead of going through f and g it will basically it will it will take this element from u and it will give you this element basically directly you don't have to go through two functions so this is g o f and of course you can see that here you're you're giving g o f some x and it's giving you some x back and for the same reason we say that g o f is equal to i of x that means that it's the identity function on 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 the set x right now f o g is basically some uh, uh, is basically some uh, function f o g is nothing but basically f of f of g of y f of g of y right now basically g of y g of y is basically this this thing over here so if you have some if you have some y over here if you have some y over here you will get some g of y over here right so this this is this is under g under g you will get some g of y over here now if you take the if you if you if you use the function f over here on on basically on this on this uh, on this basically and then and, and you, you you can see that you can see that g of y is actually equal to x right so so what that means is that if you give this to the function f over here <coughs> suppose that i give this i give this g of y to the function to the function f i would have f of basically g of y and that's the same thing as f of x and that's equal to y right so which means that basically this this function f of g of y that I can write as f o g is actually some function and I can write this as y. So this is this is some function that 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 takes y from me and it gives me y back. And therefore, for the same reason, we say that f o g is, is equal to i of y, which is the identity function on the set y, right? So that's basically the whole story. That means that through whatever method when you find the inverse of the function of course you have to prove logically that the function that you have found is the inverse of f right 
And in order to prove logically exactly that, you have to, to show that these two are the case. And that's based on some line of reasoning that I don't remember really anymore. It's, it's based on a couple of things put together, which is not important really right now. It's in the text. If you want to know more about that, you can you can go and read. Otherwise, uh, I mean, conceptually, it's not it's not that important. Otherwise, I would go read and talk about it here. Now, so that's the whole story. So the process, as you can see, is that first you need to show that basically your your function f is bijective, which means that which implies that the, that the function is invertible. Once you show that the function is invertible, you find the inverse of the function as, and you call it whatever you want. You call it G, H, or whatever, whatever you want to call it. Once you found the inverse of the function, usually basically use algebra here in order to find the inverse of the function. And then once you find the inverse of the function, you have to show that the function that you have found is actually the inverse of f. And the, and basically you, you do that by, by showing that these two are the case. And then that's basically, uh, your job is done. You have found the, the inverse of the function f and you have called it g. And that's the end of the story. Okay. So. But then, of course, depending on the case, you have to use your logic right, meaning that some functions are rational functions, some functions, in some functions, you have to basically do different types of things. Not all functions are just from some set X to some set Y. There are some functions, for example, there is something missing from this set. You have to specify that for example your domain is missing this element so it's not here it's not there it's it's like this it's like that so you have to basically depending on the situation your logic has to be right and and it it, it cannot be based on uh, memorizing a couple of examples it has you have to use your logic in order to to solve these problems and in order to use your logic then of course, you need to understand exactly the concept of the domain, the codomain, and the range of a function, and how they are connected together. And that's that's basically the whole story. Now, once we go through these examples, I'll try to basically uh, I'll, I'll try to uh, to to explain each and every step of the way why I do what I do and so that uh, so that you can develop basically the right logic for for these functions so now let me take a few minutes rest and I, we, will, we, will, we will continue with example number one okay so now to solve question example number one so we had the following we had the following question and the question was uh, and the question was basically as follows so we had the function f the function f from r to r and one thing that i that that i didn't tell you about is the is is basically the basically what this notation means exactly so I, we will talk about that as well so we had a function f from r to r which is defined as for ex as f of x is equal to 10x plus 7 and you want to find the function g from r to r such that such that g o f is equal to f o g is equal to i of r right? Well, basically, normally they are not, they are, well. Now, what's important here also to understand is that basically when you write f is a function from r to r, 
So basically this is the domain of your function and this is the co-domain of your function. Right? This is the codomain of your function. Now there is something else called the range of the function and that is absolutely important here. Now the the domain that the, the range and the codomain are basically as follows. So suppose that your 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 you have some function f over here that goes from some some set x to some set y for example. And your, your, your set X is basically some set over here. And your, your set Y is some set over here. Right? And suppose that, for example, and this is the function F. Suppose that you have these elements A, B, and C over here. And you have some elements 1, 2, 3 over here. And uh, A is mapped to 1 and b is mapped to 2 and c is mapped to 3 right so suppose that that's 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 basically the case here now in this example basically the the, the whole set x is basically called the domain of your function the whole set x is called the domain of your function and the whole set y is called the Codomain of your function. Codo codomain of your function. Now suppose that there was some there was some 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 element over here as well, for example four, and suppose that this four is not the image of any of these elements in the domain of the function. It's just here in the in the set, but it's just not it's it's not the the image of anything. It's just there in the set. Right now, this this set over here, which contains which contains only these three elements, is called the range of the function. It's called the range of your function. That means that the range of that means that the range of f in this case is equal to the set containing the elements one, two, and three. And the the codomain is y is equal to y is equal to the set containing the elements one two three and four and you can see that basically the range the range of f if i call it for example a a is a subset of the set y so the range is a subset of the of the codomain of the function it could be the whole thing but it could also be just a subset meaning that uh, meaning that uh, it could be a proper subset of the set of the set y if a set is a proper subset of 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 of, of some other set that means that basically for example if i say that a is a range or the set a for example is a is a proper subset of y that means that there is at least one element in y which is which does not belong to does not belong to the set a right if it's not a proper subset that that means that basically the set y and the set a are basically the exact same sets meaning they have the same elements and then in that case you can say that basically a is equal to y Right. So that's basically about about the range, meaning that in some cases there is a mapping, and in and in in that mapping, basically there is all of these elements that 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 basically belong to the codomain of the function, but there is no mapping to them. They're just there, not, and they're not images of any of the elements in the in the domain of the function. And so as a result of that, uh, basically, sometimes the range is just a part of the codomain of the function, but not the whole codomain of the function. So that's something that you need to take into consideration um, when you find the, the basically the, the inverses of these, the inverses of these functions. And what's, what's interesting is that 
most of the time whenever that's the case then basically the the since the function is as it is is not a basically is, a, is not an unto function then basically what we do is that we consider the, the the inverse of the function from the range of the for example from the range of f into the other set for example x meaning that for example suppose that i have let me give you an example here suppose that i have a b and c as the set x and i have one two three four and five over here and call it for example set y and there is some mapping over here which is a function f a is mapped to one b is mapped to two and c is mapped to three and these two elements are not have not been mapped to right so in this case basically the range of f the range of f is the range of f is basically one two and three this set over here the codomain of f the codomain of f is basically the set containing the elements one two three four and five and the domain of f and the domain of f is basically the set containing a b and c right now of course if i consider the function f as if i consider the function f from this set x into this set y of course the function is not is one one but it is not unto meaning that these two elements are not covered and so when i want to find basically the inverse of this function from this set into this set call it g for example then g of course i cannot if i write g for as a function from for example from y to x then it's not possible because i cannot go from four to any of these elements here or i cannot go from five to any of these elements here so i i can I, I instead of doing this what I can do is that I can write G as a set called basically the range of F the range of F into the into the set X meaning and the range of F is basically this is the range of F the range of F so the range of F is basically all of these elements that have been mapped to and so from these elements I can go back here, from this element I can go back here, from this element I can go back here, and I have no problem. So I, de I can define basically G as some function, uh, basically um, from the range of F into the, into the set X. So it's not exactly, I mean technically I would imagine that it's not exactly the, 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 for example g is not exactly the inverse of f but it is some way that you can find in order to get back from 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 the range of f into into the into the domain of f not and not from the whole codomain of f into the whole domain of f so so that's that's also something that we do in order to find the the basically the um, inverse of these functions right now Okay, so now let's 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 consider this example and see how we can solve it. Okay, so now in order to find the inverse of this function, so basically as you can see, this is a function that that basically defined on R that uh, that's basically that defined on the set of real numbers and uh, and of course it's a it's a one one function and it's an unto function 
And the reason why I'm saying that is that, so of course you have to prove that algebraically using algebra is basically um, is based on logic, based on logic of mathematics. And therefore, when you prove something using algebra, that means that you have proved that logically. So algebra is, uh, is of course a a valid tool in order to prove things in mathematics so when you you can use it in order to prove anything as long as of course as long as you stick to the roots of algebra so but then uh, basically this function over here if you had basically f of x is equal to x that would be a line like this so f of x is equal to x that would be a line like this now, if you have f of x is equal to 10x, the only difference is that the that the slope of this line is that the slope of the line becomes 10 times the slope of this line, meaning that uh, the for one unit of horizontal change in this line, you have one unit of horizontal change in this line, and then of course this line is f of x is equal to x, which means that the slope is one. Slope one means that for one unit of horizontal change, you have one unit of vertical change. So that's that's basically the meaning of the slope. <coughs> now, if the slope of the line is 10, that means that for one unit of, for every unit of horizontal change, you have 10 units of vertical change in, in that line, meaning that the line gets steeper, becomes more vertical and becomes closer gets closer and closer to the vertical axis so that means that then for one unit of horizontal change i have one two three four five six seven eight nine and ten and then you would have the, the line would go through this point and this point on the on the in the coordinate system right and so this is y and this is x and so this is f of x is equal to 10x and moreover basically you have uh, since the function has been since a 7 has been has been has been added to the output of this function that means that every point on this on this line you have to move it up by 7 units meaning that for example meaning that uh, for example this point any point that you pick on this line any point so suppose that you, you pick this point on this line you have to move it up this the point has to be moved up move up by seven units if it was for example 10x minus minus 5 for example then every point on this on this every point on this line would have to be moved down five units right so so then you can you can imagine that uh, you will end up with um, you will end up with a line which is uh, for which basically um, the line actually becomes vertically a little bit stretched meaning that basically the meaning that instead of for example 1 comma 10 so this point over here is 1 comma 10 you would have 1 comma 17 meaning that you would you would end up with the with the point like this and the line would look like this actually the it's interesting that the slope of the line would this no 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 it wouldn't change because then uh, for for the for the for the point zero also the this point would also be moved up by seven units so you would the the line would actually go not go through the, the origin anymore meaning that you would have some situation like this meaning that basically suppose that this is uh, for example f of x is equal to f of x is equal to x you can see that this is a this is some line going through the origin having a uh, having a um, slope one as you can see basically for two units of horizontal change you have two units of vertical change that is slope one 
if I make it, if I make this 10x, you can see that for for one, so this is one unit. So one for one unit of horizontal change, you have 10 units of vertical change, and then this point over here is 10 comma 1 comma 10. For if I add a 7 to here, you can see that basically the line was moved up by 7 units, meaning that the the line doesn't go through the origin anymore. It goes through the point 0 comma 7, and all the other points are moved up by 7 units. But now, long story short, that this this function is actually a a and a one one function because uh, because basically um, because as you can see, for example, this point, whatever you want to call it, call it x one or x two or whatever you want to call it, is mapped to this point over here on the on the y axis. This point is mapped to, for example, this point on the y-axis, and uh, there are basically there are basically no. Um, if the function looks like this, now these are the these are the in, the important things that you need to know about functions. So I'm taking the time to point out to all of these points because, uh, well, the the solutions are already on. Tivari Academy, you can go over to Tivari Academy. They are well written down in PDF format. You can download them and you can, you can, you can read them and hopefully you will understand them. But, uh, so that's not my job. My job is to basically, if there is something that can be said about functions, which is basically that, that I understand that which is not in the solution, I, talk about those things and of course I, I I write down the solution ultimately but it's going it's it, it sometimes it takes me a long time sometimes even two hours to talk about one single example and then if the example allows me I talk about everything there is about that example so that so that basically it is well understood so, but then about some other things, I just don't talk about. So it, it depends on a case. It's 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 based on a case to case basis. Now you can see that, for example, the function f of x was equal to f of x is equal to ten x plus seven. Ten x plus seven was some function like this. So the function looks like this. But you could have a function like for example uh, like for example uh, like for example this function here this is also a function right now you can see that basically the output of the function for this for this point for basically the output of the function here corresponds to this x and also corresponds to this x this is x1 this is x2 right so that means that f of x1 if i call this point y1 then in this case f of f of x1 is equal to f of x2 is equal to y1 and so this function of course is not is not basically this function is not a one one function because because the condition that we that we that we generally use is that f of x1 is equal to is equal to f of x2 that implies that basically x1 is equal to x2 meaning that if if there is if there is a a sum f of x1 equal to sum f of x2 then that implies that x1 is equal to x2, meaning that you're actually talking about the exact same points. There is no, there is no two separate points like this, meaning that that would, that, that would be something like this. So call this point x1 and also call it x2 and call this, for example, f of x1 and call this also f of x2. You can do that, of course. And you can see that if I write f of x1 is equal to f of x2, 
graphically you can see that f of x1 is equal to f of x2 of course is true and that also that that of course implies that x1 and x2 are the same points meaning that x1 is equal to x2 and that basically means that you're talking about the exact same point not two different points like this right and normally basically generally we say that if a function passes the horizontal line test it's a one one function meaning that for example suppose that it's a that you have a horizontal line basically going from positive infinity going all the way up to negative infinity you you drag this line all throughout the all throughout the 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 basically the the, the whole range of the function at any point in the range of the function the line is supposed to basically intersect the, the graph of the function only at most in one point meaning that now if the line comes down over here it will intersect the graph of the function in two points and there are some functions in the case of which basically the horizontal line will, 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 will basically will cut the function in like five points, six points. It's like some polynomials. They have many branches. So the, 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 the horizontal line will cut them in five points, six points and so on and so forth. So this basically means that in this case, you can see that the function does not does not pass the horizontal line test and so the function is not 1 1 in this case you can see that the function passes the horizontal line test and so the function is actually 1 1 one more line test that we have in the case of functions is basically the vertical line test if basically uh, if basically you have a if you if you imagine a vertical line and if you take it from negative infinity all the way up to positive infinity if you drag the line all throughout the domain of the function the line is supposed to intersect with the with the graph of the function at any x at exactly one point meaning that if the line is moved over here the line will intersect with the graph of the function only at one point and that basically means that if that is the case then you can say that this this line represents a, a function so that that is to check whether some whether some graph represents a a function or not so if basically if the graph is passes the vertical line test it is a function otherwise it's not meaning that for example suppose that you have uh, you have something like this for example suppose that you have something like this and for example at for this for this x you have some output here you have basically some output here and you have also some output here and uh, the rest of the function looks something like this for example um, for this x you have this you have these two outputs and then and then basically the rest of the function looks for example something like this and then and then of course this line is not connecting anything so i can so now at this at this at this x and this is y basically this is x now uh, if i if i basically if i if I if I imagine a vertical line over here and if I drag it throughout the domain of the function when the line reaches here it basically in this this point is the graph of the function this point is also the graph of the function and if I call this point for example x1 and if I call this point for example uh, for example f of f of uh, f1 for example and if i call this for example call it for example y1 if i call this for example y1 if i call this for example y2 you can see that um, f of f of x1 
is equal to y1 and it's also equal to y2 and y1 is not equal to y2 right so now i don't really know what to do meaning that f of x1 is equal to y1 and also f of x1 is also equal to y2 meaning that for example you can say that f of 2 is equal to 5 also is equal to 7 something some some situation like this now I, and then of course you can you can see that 5 is not equal to 7 so this is logic it makes no sense so so as you can see the vertical line test basically if you move it throughout the domain of the function if it if it intersects with the graph of the function in more than one point that means that this is not a function in the first place right if if it intersects with the graph of the function exactly in one point that basically means that it is a function it could also of course it's possible that it intersects uh, with nothing which is which is also which in which case you you would you could actually have a function as well but that's that's another story but the point here is that then if your if the graph passes the vertical line test that means that you have a function if the graph passes the horizontal line test that means that you have a you have a uh, you have a one one function right and i will sh i will tell you more about about how to check graphically whether a function is unto or not right so i i i i i i'll, I'll we will talk about that as well and in order to check that basically let's imagine that you have some function like this so so i, I in case i didn't i didn't actually tell you about what is a what is a one one function a one one function is basically the kind of function where uh where basically uh, a one one function is basically the kind of function mm. <clears throat> okay so let me let me actually end this video here in the next video i will i will tell you about uh, about first of all what is a one one function and then i have already talked about it of course which, which doesn't make much sense but then i forgot to tell you about one one functions then we will talk a little bit about unto functions and then i'll show you a test for the unto fun unto functions as well and then we will um, solve the solve example exercise number one i'll see you in the next video and thank you